commissioners and members of the public can please take their seats. The Manhattan Board will come to order. My name is Nicola Meserve. I'm from Massachusetts, Division of Marine Fisheries, and have the honor to be your chairperson today. Uh, we'll start by looking at our agenda. You'll note that we're starting 15 minutes early. We're going to try to keep to that schedule, um, reserving that 15 minutes for our item five. Um, so if there, are there any other changes to the agenda today? Seeing none, we'll consider that approved. Um, you also have your proceedings from August of 2019. Are there any changes or revisions to the minutes from August of 2019? Seeing none, we'll consider those as approved as well. We'll now move on to public comment. Um, this is for items that are not on the agenda. And um, I have a sign-in sheet that has three people listed on it that would like to speak, including uh, Phil Zalsak, Tom Lilly, and Patrick Paquette. Um, in order to try to stick with our time, are there other people that would, are plan would like to speak to topics not on the agenda? All right, seeing none, we have 10 minutes on the agenda for this. So, um, <coughs> Phil, if you can try to keep it to three minutes, that would be great. And please yes. state your name and affiliation for the record. Thank you. Uh, Phil Zalzak, I'm president of the Southern Maryland Recreational Fishing Organization. Uh, I'm here to talk uh, on behalf of recreational fishermen at Chesapeake Bay. That's about 240,000 people in Virginia and Maryland. Uh, I would like to direct your attention to your goals and objectives under Amendment 3, which talk to equitable ecological and economic benefits. Uh, recreational fishermen are part of that. They fall under something those, uh, uh, fall under that uh, goal as those who extract and utilize predators which rely on menhaden as a source of prey. So what do I want to talk about? I want to talk about three basic facts and two scientific studies. First fact is, if you recall, from about 1973 to 1980, Reduction fisheries took on the order of 200,000 metric tons. According to Dr. Michael Wilberg, that's over a billion fish out of the Chesapeake Bay for eight years. You think that have would any impact on the Menhaden? If you'll recall, there was a striped bass moratorium following that. All right, that's fact number one. Fact number two, data provided me by the state of Maryland, Virginia, the Potomac Rubber Fishery, uh, Fisheries Commission, uh, Marty, Marty Gary over there, I'm looking at him right now, they show that the commercial harvest for the last 20 years, this is for the Potomac River and the Chesapeake Bay, for striped bass has declined by 34%, weak fish by 99%, blue fish by 85%, summer flounder by 92%, and 80% for Spanish mackerel. Perhaps we're starving these fish to death, the, these fishing, these predators to death. Maybe we're not overfishing them. Uh, fact number three, according to uh, uh, the 2019 special fishing report, page 22, which talks to saltwater fishing, the first part of it is, is uh, freshwater, there's been 11% decline in the American saltwater fishing participants. Based on data that I've gotten from the state of Maryland and Virginia, in the case of Maryland, we've lost 50,000 saltwater fishermen since 2004. Virginia has lost 36,000 fishermen since uh, 2013. So that's a 36% decline and a 20% decline, or about 85,000 fewer recreation saltwater fishermen. All right, so those are the three basic facts. People say there's been no scientific evidence. There's a problem. Well, I, I beg to differ with that. It would differ with that. I got uh, two sources of information. One is uh, Dr. Michael Wilberg. You may have heard of him. He co-authored a paper that was published last uh, November. And what did it say? They reviewed data on about a million fish that were tagged uh, along the coast. And what did they find? They found that basically, uh, in, in what he called Region 2, which is the area right off the state of Maryland, that the fish really don't migrate that much between about June and October. And that's a core area or a core time when reduction fishing is taking place. So if you devastate a region, you may still be 
within the quota for the entire Atlantic coast, but you've not only devastated the Atlantic maidenhead, you've devastated all the predators who feed on those. That's scientific study number one. There was another one that just came out here recently. One of the co-authors was Dr. Thomas Miller, who's a director of the Chesapeake Biological Lab, and they talk about, and I'll quote, striped bass were most sensitive to increase in Atlantic Menhaden fishing, largely due to their strong dietary reliance on prey species. But other higher tropic level groups, birds, high, highly migratory species, sharks, and marine mammals were also negatively impacted. All right, so that's three facts, two scientific studies. What a 30 seconds, thank you. According to the uh, Addendum 3, uh, 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 the, the latest striped bass report, uh, the impact, the economic impact of striped bass and what has happened to them involves uh, a total of 7.7 uh, 7 billion coastwide and $104,000, 104, 104,000 jobs. That's uh, that's pretty significant. That's one predator out of 22. So I got the following recommendations. One, shut down the Atlantic Menhaden reduction fishery in the Chesapeake Bay and reduce the fishing season. Two, recognize recreational fishermen as equal stakeholders in the future of predator, predator fisher by reallocating Atlantic Menhaden status quota on sound conservation principles, not reduction fishery. And three, fully fund Atlantic Menhaden biomass survey as proposed by the Chesapeake Biological Laboratory. And I've already talked to Michael Wilberg. It'll cost between two hundred and four hundred thousand dollars and $400,000. It's an investment we have to make because we need to find out where we are. With that, I'll uh, thank the uh, chairman and I'll thank this board for your, my time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zalsak. Tom Lilly. And please try to keep to three minutes, please, Tom. Chairman Misor, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'm here representing the Menhaden Project in, in Chesapeake Bay, and that's a very hard act to follow, but I will give it a shot. <laughs> you know, we heard Phil talk about the 80,000 people that are saltwater fishermen that, are, that aren't there anymore. And uh, I'd like to add a little parenthesis to that. You know, that number doesn't include the kids that aren't fishing. Because if you're a kid, in Maryland at least, and you're under 16 years of age, uh, you haven't got to have a fishing license. But a lot of these kids aren't fishing anymore in Maryland on the Chesapeake Bay. I know this, this hits home because my, my grandchildren, who uh, eight, nine years ago, uh, they were loving starting fishing, and now, uh, they seems like they always have something else to do. Um, they, they've lost interest because they're, you know, I could go on and on, but I know every one of you knows that that's something that's going on up and down the, the coast. So it's the people that count in this thing, folks. That's who you really should be thinking about. It's the people. It's the 400,000 Marylanders that are, that are fishermen, yeah. But it's also millions of Marylanders who love the Chesapeake Bay and treasure those Maryland and Virginia traditions. That's what we're really talking about here. Uh, you know, to a lot of the people, it's a bunch of statistics, it's a bunch of formulas. But for a lot of us, it's our lives that we're talking about here. So if I got another minute, you do. Okay. Um, I just wanted to, you know, be as quick as I can on this. One thing I'd like for you to be thinking about uh, as the spring rolls around, that uh, there are two things going on out there on the Atlantic coast. Uh, you got a bunch of Menhaden coming down toward the Chesapeake Bay, and uh, in May and June, we know roughly how many, because we know what the factory fishing catches. They catch about 30,000 tons, about a third of their quota in those two months. Uh, I wish you would look at the BOA, um, uh, NOAA statistics out of Beaufort 
on the monthly catch. And what you're going to see is in April and May, there are very few menhaden out there coming toward the bay. And think about those eight persaners out there after those, relentlessly after those schools uh, in April and May. And take a look at that, how few uh, schools are really there. It's about 15,000 schools total, 20,000 uh, Menhaden per uh, 20,000 schools. Okay, that's happening. The Menhaden are coming down in those schools toward the bay, but there's another thing going on too, as you all know. Those, those spawning female spawning stock, rockfish are about a million of them or more are in the bay. And those fish are coming down and those rockfish are in there and the question that you all have to decide is will they get together? Will those rockfish get together with those Menhaden? You are the people that are in control of that. It's an allocation decision in April and May. Who gets allocated those 1,500 uh, schools of Menhaden? Who do they go to? Now, I don't have to tell you, Amendment 3 makes it very clear how you are to make that value judgment. But Tom, I'm just going to ask you to wrap it up, please. Okay. Um, think about those two things, those two interests colliding, because it's just that simple. We have all this complexity, but what it really comes down to is, uh, is those 1,500 schools of Menhaden going to get to those fish that need that food so badly? So please think about how you can make that work because it's not working right now. Those fish are being caught. Thank you, Tom. And up next is Patrick Paquette. Thank you, Madam Chair. Patrick Paquette, recreational fishing advocate from Massachusetts. I'm a member of the Menhaden AP. I come before you today on behalf of the Mass Stray Bass Association and a group of over 40 recreational sport fishing clubs that have identified themselves for many years before this commission as the Menhaden Coalition. Um, I also, in full disclosure, do a little bit of work on behalf of the Teddy Roosevelt Conservation Partnership on this issue. Um, that being said, my comments are uh, process related and not details related. Um, and that is regard to openness and transparency with the ongoing and soon to be peer reviewed stock assessment. Um, in the past on the CDAR website, um, within weeks of a, the peer review, a draft stock assessment report has been posted. Um, we have played the game according to your rules. We have engaged scientists to participate in stock assessments and we have identified some things and had some concerns regarding natural mortality and some assumptions regarding natural mortality that were expressed during the stock assessment meetings. What we are not able to see prior to the peer review, as, which is unusual as compared to other CDAO process um, that we have participated in, is the draft stock assessment report. So we am also aware that in different regions and in some states, some of our organizations and, or in related organizations have actually tried to go through legal means to try and make this happen. I come before you today to ask one, one specific thing. Treat this Menhaden stock assessment process at CDAR exactly like others have been and post the draft stock assessment report on the CDAR website as has been done before. Please adhere to the CDAR policies and procedures regarding complete documentation, public involvement and transparency. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Um, I guess I'll just a follow up to ask if there has been a, a deviation from the process and if those draft reports are planned to be released prior to the peer review. Thank you, Madam Chair. Under the ASMFC peer review process, we usually, or we, not we usually, we, the publication of uh, draft peer review documents are not shared publicly. Um, and CDAR is indicating they're deferring to us on this one to use the ASMFC process. Um, the reason we do that, other than, I mean, I, it, you know, I don't want to just say we just don't, we don't want you guys to see what's going on, is we've had a number of examples in the past where draft documents have been published and um, folks have taken those and, and the draft results have shown up in newspaper articles and, and all over the internet and those sorts of things and then we get to the peer review and things significantly change and then we end up with this sort of competing stock assessment information from the draft documents to the final post peer review document. So that's why the 
commission process was modified to not share those documents prior to peer review. Does anyone around the table have any comment or thoughts on that or we're okay? It's the ASMC process, seems an appropriate way to move forward. Um, so that was the end of the public comment um, for item three. And we'll move on to a progress update on the 2019 uh, single species and ecological reference point stock assessments. Um, I've been informed that we're going to go straight to Dr. Drew for the uh, ERP benchmark stock assessment update that there, and that there's um, nothing particularly new from Dr. Anstead on the single species assessment, although she is here if there are any questions. So Dr. Drew. Thank you, Madam Chair. So. Uh, just to kind of remind you guys where we are in this process, um, the assessment reports are complete and have been submitted to the peer review. The peer review is occurring next week and we'll have the final results um, and the peer review report available for the February meeting. That'll be part of your meeting materials. But I think we wanted to take a, a step to sort of, as we've completed the assessment, to start you guys thinking about how you want to respond to this assessment. So I want to talk briefly about what's next. And I'm not going to be talking really about specific answers or specific numbers. Um, but one of the things that, um, because as Bob said, these things can change during peer review. Um, and so I think overall though, we've explored a lot of models and the final answer is really that there is no one right answer for ecological reference points for Atlantic Menhaden because it depends on what you guys want the ecosystem to look like. So how abundant do you want your predators to be? How hard do you want to be able to fish your predators and your other prey species in the ecosystem? All of these considerations will have uh, implications for the right amount of menhaden that you can take off. And so what we are providing is essentially a tool for you guys to evaluate these questions. Um, we focused on a number, we have a number of different models from very simple to very complex. The very complex models include basically 61 different species and species groups within the ecosystem. But we also focused on some intermediate complexity models of, that included Atlantic menhaden, striped bass, bluefish, weakfish, spiny dogfish, and Atlantic herring. So um, these had the best available data, they're all significant predators on menhaden, and they're all of interest to ASMFC's management process. So the important thing to consider is that all of these species already have management goals and objectives in terms of what their biomass target is, what their F target is. And to a certain extent, that limits what this management board can do with this information. So the board needs to start thinking about not just how they're going to manage Menhaden, but how the commission itself is going to manage Menhaden. So the question is, do you want to manage to the existing FMP objectives for these predators, or do you want to redefine these objectives in consultation and in trade-off with the Atlantic Menhaden fishery? If you want to consider redefining your predator objectives, ISFMP Policy Board and NOAA Fisheries will need to weigh in on how we're redefining these. So Atlantic Menhaden, Menhaden Board can't say, I want to keep striped bass here and have the striped bass board having a different reference point. In order to have successful management out of this process, we all need to be on the same page. So one option is certainly to say, these existing reference points have been set by these single species FMPs and that sort of creates a, a limited environment that we can move Menhaden around in and think about how much we want to fish Menhaden in. But if you want to expand that framework, you're, need to, you're going to need to bring in other stakeholders, other management boards, other management agencies to really have a full ecosystem-based fishery management um, process, which will, of course, take a lot longer. So. Um, the, I think the board needs to start thinking about, and we're not, we're not going to have this conversation today because we have other bigger conversations to have, but when you come back in February, you need to start thinking about what are our next steps from here. Is the Atlantic Menhaden board only going to focus on existing FMP objectives for other species? Is that your first step? Is the next step to expand this process to the full commission? Um, are we going to manage to predator targets? Are we going to manage to predator thresholds that exist? Um, all of these are sort of questions that you should be thinking about so that when you come back in February and see the results, hopefully that have passed peer review, that we can provide you with a tool that will let you make these trade-offs and let you see some of the options that you have in terms of Menhaden reference points, in terms of allowable harvest. And thinking about this ahead of time will let you guys provide us with better information right from the get-go. So you guys, I'm assuming, will have some things, some scenarios of what the ecosystem should look like that you would like us to evaluate. 
we can come back and we can bring that back to you and show you the answers. And I think to have that process move quickly and move efficiently, the more you guys can be prepared to think about, do you like your striped bass targets? Do you like your bluefish targets? Do you want the target? Do you want the threshold? Those kinds of questions um, so that we can lay out um, some scenarios for the technical group to evaluate in an efficient way and move this process forward rather than a lot of back and forth. Um, so I can take questions now on that, but I think this is really more about you guys getting ready, going back and thinking about what, what do you want, not just Menhaden, but the entire ecosystem to look like so you can give us some direction in terms of providing you with options. Thank you, Katie. Um, I'm looking at the, the policy board's agenda later this week, and there is a topic about um, ecological reference point implications. Is that a continuation of this conversation? Yeah, so I think the, it's also on the policy board because one of the options for this board would be to say we want the full-blown ecosystem-based management right out the gate. So we have to be able to address, adjust, and evaluate targets for predators as well as targets for Manhattan, in which case we need to bring the full policy board in on this conversation. Um, and I think we also want the full policy board to kind of have an opinion on how ecosystem-based management is going to work for the entire commission. Is this just a Menhaden thing? And that Menhaden will, is the only thing we're going to worry about, um, and we're going to just keep everything else, all other management the same, or are we going to really, is this the first step in a much larger evolution for the commission? And so we're going to start that conversation um, at, at policy board. Thank you, Katie. So are there uh, specific questions about this for Menhaden today, or do you want to, if, if the board wants to hold questions to the policy board meeting when it's going to be talk, talked about in a larger context? Just uh, Lynn Fagley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just real quickly, uh, um, Dr. Drew, to your point, there was a survey that was done on striped bass, sort of what did we want out of our striped bass fishery. Is that being considered as a starting point for this, or are you thinking about rerunning that? Or? So right now, um, we've developed some example targets and thresholds based on what is currently the targets and thresholds for striped bass that are in management right now. I think this is certainly one of that it is an example of the board has the striped bass board has been considering changing reference points or changing what they want the striped bass fishery to look like and that's a kind of a feedback process where do they want do you want to do that in isolation or do you want to loop menhaden in is absolutely a question for the future but for now we're just going based on the example that we're presenting is going to be based on what's an existing uh, fmp any other questions john mcmurray Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so it was mentioned that if we go the full-blown ecosystem management, we have targets for predators as well as targets for menhaden that will take considerably longer. Um, how much longer are we talking, you know, half a dozen years, a decade, or are we just talking a couple of years? It becomes a matter not on the science side, but more on the management side. That is, how long is it going to take you guys to come to agreement on what striped bass and menhaden should look like together, let alone looping in NOAA on this? So I think the, the key is we really, th as a working group, as a technical group, we see this assessment as this is the first step. And so there's steps along the way that you can take to get to maybe the end evolution of the commission is there is no single species boards anymore. There is only a policy board where we do these evaluations for all of our species coherently. That's 10 or 20 years down the road. Maybe we take the first step at the next meeting and say, we're going to manage Menhaden to sustain predators at their existing objectives. We can put those measures in place pretty quickly relative to that kind of technical work is, you know, that those numbers are set essentially almost. And so then we can work on the next step, which is how do we incorporate striped bass and menhaden conversations together, and that's a longer process, that's a management process question, but it doesn't have to be, is that the first step that the, that the board wants to jump to, or does the board want to take some baby steps in between and focus on um, what's already written down on paper? Any other questions? Uh, John Clark, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the presentation, Katie. Um, just following up on what's been asked already, obviously with striped bass and with other species, we're seeing 
huge changes in the estimated biomass out there from the MRIP figures. I know you're still working on quite a few different uh, multi-species models right now. How flexible and how, how easily would it be, you're calling these tools, that when something does change in these, that whatever model is chosen could give really useful feedback uh, in a reasonable amount of time? Um, that's a good question. So first of all, I would like to say all of the species that actually are going into the, um, the new models do use the new MRIP data. So all of that is completely up to date um, for the predator species. They're all using the new MRIP data. Um, or at least the, for our key focal species, they're all using the new MRIP data. Um, and our intermediate complexity models were chosen so that as new stock assessments became available, they could more easily be incorporated into these models as opposed to um, some of the more complicated models that do require um, very intensive data sources and would require a lot of effort to update. Um, the intermediate complexity models could be updated on something that's more aligned with um, the standard single species assessment timelines, as long as we get those assessments lined up correctly. Follow up. Uh, just quickly, so you anticipate having several different uh, multi-species models that would be part of the tools that would be used here? So not as part of the tools, as part of the um, assessment going for, as part of the assessment itself, we explored a number of different tools so that we could compare sort of the effects of very simple models versus very complex models. Um, but the tool that we're recommending is a specific, uh, is again, this is why we're not, we don't want to get too much into it because it depends on what the peer review panel thinks about all of this, but we're going to recommend a, one specific tool to approach this. But there are other models being explored to kind of look at some of the effects of those model assumptions and the complexity and the data availability. Tom Foti. I think, I think we're back on. Maybe? Yeah, I, I don't, I'm not going to turn to Katie to try to answer that question. Um, I don't think it's, it's fair for her to have to, to handle or not. I'm kind of going to take it as a bit of a rhetorical Tom question, Tom, that, you know, we're all looking for answers sooner than, you know, 22 years. I, I'm not sure I want to be here in 22 years either. <laughs> um, are, there, are there other questions around the table? If not, um, Katie's given us a lot to think about in preparation for our next board meeting, so thank you for that. Um, some big questions to keep us up at night. Um, and we'll move on to uh, issue five, an update on the 2019 reduction fishery harvest from Chesapeake Bay. Um, I think everyone is aware at this point that um, Omega Protein has exceeded Amendment 3's Chesapeake Bay reduction fishery cap of 51,000 metric tons. Um, that occurred on September 6th. Uh, the latest reports that I have are that the reduction landings from the bay are now at about 65,000 metric tons. So our agenda item does um, address the board to consider compliance with the FMP on this issue. Um, this is a largely familiar discussion as we've had it um, several times already. Um, but I'll just set the stage and quickly recover the actions that the board has taken previously on this topic. Um, which will bring us back uh, about a year and a half ago to when the board first reviewed state compliance with Amendment 3's um, implementation deadline. That was when uh, the board realized that the Virginia legislature had not reduced the bay cap from the Amendment 2 level of 87,216 metric tons to the Amendment 3 level of 51,000 metric tons. A motion was made to recommend uh, noncompliance for not fully and effectively implementing and enforcing Amendment 3. 
Um, and that motion was postponed until August of 2018 to, in the interim, send a letter to Virginia to detail the contents of the motion. Um, in August of 2018, when the board reconvened, the noncompliance motion was again postponed until February of 2019. Uh, both of those postponements sought to give the Virginia legislature additional time to act given the political realities of a noncompliance finding. August was the meeting when uh, NOAA Council uh, provided some input that helped us in that uh, discussion. Um, the postponement in 2018 also recognized that the bay cap was unlikely to be exceeded that year, and at the end of the year we were, knew that the landings did come in under the cap at about 32,000 metric tons for 2018. Um, so then moving to February, the noncompliance motion was postponed indefinitely, uh, provided that the reduction harvest from the bay did not exceed 51,000 metric tons. The motion also committed the board to um, consider action to modify the bay cap after it completes action on the ERPs. Uh, things went along smoothly, you could say, for a, a couple months until September when um, middle of the month the ASMC leadership notified the states that Omega had exceeded the bay cap. Um, prior to that, um, from the documents that are in your briefing book, um, you should be aware that both VMRC and the ASMFC had urged Omega um, otherwise and had stressed the importance of cooperation and, and following the cap. Um, Omega released a, a statement uh, regarding the cap and said it would um, stay within the, the codified level in Virginia's law, that being the one from Amendment 2. Um, and then there was additional um, communication from Omega's um, justifying its action and, and committing to a, a self-imposed 67,000 metric ton harvest limit. So that brings us to today. Um, in a sense, not much has changed from our previous discussions on this point, other than the fact that um, the Bay Cap has now been exceeded. Um, and we know that despite uh, the best efforts of VMRC, Virginia has not been able to implement or enforce an FMP requirement, um, a situation upon which the Atlantic Coastal Act would direct ASMFC to f do a noncompliance finding. However, we also recognize that the Secretary of Commerce is directed in the same act to also consider whether the measure is necessary for the conservation of the fishery in question. So um, this last slide is just the language from the Commission's charter uh, as a reminder that if there is to be a noncompliance motion considered that it should include a statement as to how the failure to implement or enforce the required measure jeopardizes the conservation of the resource. Um, as defined in the Charter, conservation does um, refer to not just the coastal fishery resource, that being Menhaden, but also to the marine environment and um, other coastal fishery resources. Um, so lastly, just before turning to the board for discussion on this, I'll point out that there was a, a large number of comments in your supplemental uh, materials um, about this topic, and they speak to the passion of stakeholders on this issue as does the public comment record for Amendment 3. I'm confident that everyone here had a chance to look at those. Um, and because of the time constraints and the extensive feedback the board has already had on this issue, uh, public comment may be limited during this meeting on the topic. Um, but I hope the public understands that those around this table are seriously engaged on the issue and recognize your views and appreciate that input as we move forward. Um, so I think to, to move us forward quickly, um, you know, we've had a lot of discussions. Uh, if there are any questions first about where we stand with the Bay Cap or the Amendment 3 requirements or, or anything like that, well, let's try to address those first. Any questions? Pat Keller. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I really don't have a question, but the the 800 pound gorilla here is really how Omega is going to respond. And um, since I was happy to put somebody on the spot in the lobster board meeting, I'm wondering if we can't put Omega on the spot here today since they're in the room and ask them to give us some additional background on this issue. Um, I, I, the thing that I struggle most about this is while we deal with compliance issues on a state by state issue, here it's a company, it's a single company. And I think we should hear from that company. 
Is there any opposition to the board to inviting Omega Protein to the microphone? I, if they are so willing, I understand that there are some members here. Adam Nowalski? So I don't object to that route. I would just highlight that while I can't dispute that there is one company prosecuting this fishery, we talked a little bit about precedent before. It's really the state that we're responsible for responding to the management actions that we implement. So I think we should just be very careful with our tone towards specific companies and how it might apply to any other non-compliance finding because it's the states that are beholden to complying with what we ask them to do. With that said, Adam, I think that's a good point. And for that reason, um, you know, I ex expect that there may be a motion and public comment will be um, allowed in a limited fashion at that time. So if at, at that time, um, Omega Protein wishes to be part of the public comment on a motion, then I'll, I'll turn to them first. Um, if that, Pat. All right, any other, are there any questions? And if not, to kind of direct our conversation, I think it would be helpful to have a motion to consider at this point. John McMurray. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have such a motion. Go ahead, please, if, if staff has it, John. Okay. Move that the Atlantic Menhaden Management Board recommend to the ISFMP Policy Board that the Commonwealth of Virginia be found out of compliance for not fully and effectively implementing and enforcing Section 4.3.7, Chesapeake Bay Reduction Fishery Cap of Amendment 3 to the Interstate Fishery Management Plan for Atlantic Menhaden. Commonwealth of Virginia must implement an annual total allowable harvest from the Chesapeake Bay by the reduction fishery of no more than 51,000 metric tons. The implementation of this measure is necessary to achieve the goals and objectives of the FMP and maintain the Chesapeake Bay marine environment to assure the availability of the ecosystem's resources on a long-term basis. Thank you. Is there a second to the motion? Sarah Peek? John, would you like to speak? To the motion first? I would. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first of all, it's pretty clear that Virginia has failed to adopt um, the management measures in Amendment 3, and Omega Protein has willingly exceeded the bay cap. And I would argue that the bay cap is necessary for conservation. Uh, while the board commissioned some work that was unable to conclude there was localized depletion, was also unable to conclude that there wasn't localized depletion. In the absence of science showing that the reduction of fishery doesn't cause localized depletion, then a five-year average is reasonable. And if I understand correctly, Menhaden recruitment in the Chesapeake Bay has been low for several years. Um, the science is pretty clear that removing that much Menhaden has had an effect on striped bass and other predators, uh, striped bass in particular, which is overfished. More importantly, that bay cap was about preventing localized depletion from occurring, and we made a policy decision to do that when we capped harvest at a historical average of 51,000 metric tons. It was a decision to protect one of the largest nursery grounds, not only for Menhaden, but for just about everything else, again, referencing striped bass. And I believe we are certainly in our purview to do that. Whether or not the Secretary of Commerce will support the Commission's findings should not be the basis for a decision here. The authority of the commission is jeopardized either way, but a failure to find Virginia out of compliance is a sure way to reduce the commission's authority. I'm also certain there will be a lot of pushback on this one, particularly from the recreational fishing community. This will not be an easy decision for commerce. It will not be like the last decision that it made. And uh, for these reasons, I feel like it's, it's the right thing to do, to find them out of compliance. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I think I'd like to go the route of um, speaking in favor and speaking against. If I can get a show of hands for people that would like to speak in favor of the motion around the table. And, and uh, let's see, those that would like to speak against it. 
well, there'll be uh, an opportunity again, but um, we'll proceed with uh, the five that have raised their hands so far um, and not go further than that or unless there are people that want to speak against it and we can alternate back and forth. So with that said, uh, Richie White. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this clearly is a very difficult decision and I didn't come here <clears throat> for this meeting knowing how um, I was going to decide on this issue. Um, <clears throat> this motion is very compelling um, and I tend to agree that it is time for us to take a stand and we cannot worry about the outcome. It is uh, to Adam's point in all due respect, it is the Commonwealth of Virginia that has not put in the regulations that we have passed. But the company could, could have been good stewards and followed the lead of the commission. The Commonwealth of Virginia didn't force them to catch over the bay cap. <clears throat> and that's very, that's very disappointing and it clearly, I think, does not make friends around this table when it comes to our amendment process going forward and reallocation. So for those reasons, I reluctantly uh, support this motion. Thank you, Richie. Steve Bowman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first and foremost, on behalf of the Commonwealth of Virginia, I'd like to apologize for being in this situation. Um, I'd also like to thank you for indulging the Commonwealth of Virginia on two previous occasions where we truly did attempt to implement some type of mechanism that would remove us from the state that we're in today. Let me just start by stay, saying that having the stigma uh, from the Commonwealth of Virginia's perspective of being out of compliance on anything is not a good position in which we desire to be in. Governor Northam, Secretary Strickler, the team in the Commonwealth of Virginia have worked tireless, tirelessly in an attempt to improve the environment, improve the water quality, to do good things in the Commonwealth of Virginia. However, the laws and the setup in the Commonwealth of Virginia are such that not there are times where the administration and its team can impose what we believe are the appropriate things to do as it relates to the management of our fisheries. So for that, again, I thank you for your indulgence over the last 18 months. To follow up on what's been said about the commission process, I have been coming up here since 1992, came up here as a a young snot and as a deputy chief in the law enforcement division, but I've taken great strides to pay attention to what's going on around this commission table and learned a lot from the folks that have been here, a great deal. And I respect every minute and every, every encounter that we've had. And we do have a process. The process is set by law that the commission is responsible for setting caps on fisheries. Some of us leave here and don't like it. Some of us leave here and like it, but any way you look at it, we end up leaving. To Mr. Nowoski's point, yeah, and friends are friends and business is business, as I've said before, but to Mr. Nowoski's point, to others' point, uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, as far as the, the administration, would love to have not been here in this situation. And it is true that one entity which uh, has been at times a good partner in the Commonwealth of Virginia, but at times that brings us here today, we're a little concerned with. If the Commonwealth of Virginia and the administration had its way, we would not be here today. So there is a process in place, and to maintain the integrity of this great commission, I believe that there is no other option but to move forward after we've, ex after we've exhausted all of our attempts to do what's right we, it brings us here to where we are today. To one other final point, we know that we have science coming down the path, and I'll be quite honest, after hearing today, I'm not uh, as enthused about the 
speed in which the process moves, but that sometimes I've been told that I'm someone that way. I tend to want things faster than, than, than later. Uh, but the science is coming. And this company had an opportunity to engage as good partners to ride the boat with us a little bit longer and look to see what the science could be in order to come to an appropriate cap. And the 51,000 metric tons, it's been said that it's an arbitrary number. I've never known this, this commission since I've been here to do anything that's completely arbitrary because there are so many good minds around here that know the science. It was based on some averages and it was based on a precautionary decision. And I think the decision, although it can be questioned, the decision was one that was made with well in, that was well intended. So that being said, again, although I do not at all like the idea of the Commonwealth of Virginia being labeled out of compliance with anything, I intend to vote for the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Brian Plumley. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, as the GA for Virginia, I just want to acknowledge the dozens of fishermen <clears throat> through their leadership who have written or called about the lack of oversight of the primary permit holder for this species by our legislature. Both recreational and commercial fishermen of our state complain about two primary points. First, the decline in Menhaden relates directly to the decline in the predator species. Less food, less fish. This is perhaps a difficult science and a subtle point for our legislature, but perhaps at this coming session they will recognize it and enact and adopt um, the recommended allotment. Even if the information is anecdotal, we know our state scientists with VIMS and Marine, si Marine Agency rely routinely upon the observation of our fishermen to enact regulations. The second primary point is that there is a perceived double standard which puts effective enforcement of our laws in jeopardy. When we allow a powerful actor to ignore regulations, all of our regulations are diminished. Our legislature meets in January, and it's my sincere wish, is that this finding of noncompliance today will cause them to act to adopt the cap, but also to divest themselves of their regulatory authority over this single species and put it in the hands of the Virginia Marine Resource Commission. Thank you. Tom Fody. I figured I had to say something because all the comments that were put on me because New Jersey was the one that went out of compliance and went to the Secretary of Commerce. But that was in a different situation. We were not asking for more fish. We were not asking to get away from the conservation that was being opposed on us. All we were asking for is we want to use our own rules and get the same size that we wanted for our state and that what another state had. We took a greater reduction, matter of fact, as it turned out, than all the states that were required to do because we knew what we were going to do with our state. So we were on going out of compliance to basically get more fish or to basically harvest more fish. We just wanted to have a different size. This is a different situation. Uh, my concern has always been is that we had reduction plants up and down the coast. Matter of fact, North Carolina was the, the last one to have one. And my question has always been, what makes one company allowed to absorb the reduction uh, harvest of all the other states? It was not, we have no other fishery that did that. When we did away with um, the fly net fishery, we did away with certain fisheries, the uh, dragger fishery and the weak fish. We didn't give that to one other dragger from another state because they were allowed to do it. We basically just distributed a pool among all the actors in that fishery. So having said that, I look at what's going on with Menhaden, and I've been sitting around this table since, well, not as a commissioner, but only since 1990, but as a player since about 87. And this is one of the problems we've always had with the Menhaden industry. At least it's not as bad as it used to be, where there used to be five members of the industry and the five states that used to harvest the resource that actually managed the resource. At least now it's the full commission almost, and it's basically a better place than we are. And that's one of the reasons I'm supporting this. We need to do what we have to do. Whether it's in the future might be voting New Jersey or other, we'll make our arguments before the Secretary of Commerce and let them do that. But this is for conservation of the other resources, too, that's involved in this fishery, and not just the stock of Manhattan. 
Thank you, Tom. Emerson, you'll be next. Um, before you go, though, um, could I get a, a show of hands from the audience? How many people think they may want to address the board on this issue, taking in consideration the way the discussion is going? I'm just looking to do some time management. Um, one, just one? Okay. Do me two? Okay. Thank you. Emerson, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, although I was not supportive of lowering the bay cap when we voted on that, um, because it, it didn't, in my mind, have um, a lot of solid uh, biological reasons to do so. However, this board passed that resolution that set that Chesapeake Bay cap. So I support this motion, even though I did not support lowering the cap, I fully support this motion. Um, the board made a decision, and I think we have to stand by that decision. Um, regardless of what we think the Secretary of Commerce may or may not do, we can't worry about that. We need to do what we have to do to maintain the integrity of this commission. So I fully support this motion, and I feel badly for Mr. Bowman and his staff, kind of caught between a, a rock and a hard place, but um, um, hopefully this action uh, may prompt the legislature to give them regulatory authority. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to turn to the public now. And uh, first I saw was Ben Landry. And Tom Lilly, I also saw your hand. You'll be next. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to address you guys. My name is Ben Landry. I'm with uh, Omega Protein. Um, you guys clearly know uh, my company and what we do. Um, you guys have um, you know, been a, a significant part of, of our operations for a long time. So I come before you today not with any illusions that this what I've seen is going to turn around in the next uh, five minutes or so. But I, I do think it's important that you guys understand how the 2019 fishing season worked for Omega Protein. So if you guys indulge me, it, it may be a little bit over a couple of minutes. So um, I guess to start things off, you know, I've heard a couple of speakers today talk about the decline of Menhaden. And it, that simply is not the case. The stock assessments have proven over and over again, and you're seeing this uh, play itself out as the stock has increased uh, up to Maine, you're seeing record catches. So this population is robust and healthy and sustainable. It's not a declining, I'm sorry, it's not a declining stock. So I think that's important. So take that into account as, as you guys think about, you know, how to view this overage. So it, it, our season started in May. Um, in the Chesapeake Bay, and we saw a number of schools inside the bay. We had a little bit of difficult time finding fish outside of the bay in the very beginning of the year. Um, we had internal discussions about this. Uh, that was unusual to us, um, but we thought that since it was such, you know, you know m moderate amounts of harvest at the time, um, that there was going to be ample time for it to regulate itself where the fish move outside into the ocean. And, um, you know, as that kind of continued into June, um, we caught a break in July. And all of our vessels uh, every single day in July were outside in the ocean. And we thought that the situation had normalized itself, that, you know, we were getting back to the norms where the majority of the fish caught were outside of the ocean, adhering to your uh, stated purpose in 2006 to fish more outside in the bay. I think we have a very strong and very present record of that is adhering to your word and fishing less in the bay. So in July, not a single fish was caught in the, in the Chesapeake Bay. And then we had some weather events early August where we had a difficult time fishing out into the ocean um, for weather and for safety. But we saw really enormous schools inside the bay, just inside the bay, inside the Bay Bridge Tunnel, which, you know, we said, all right, well, listen, let's, let's fish in the bay. You know, we know it's going to move our bay number up a little bit, but we've got to keep, you know, this operation going. We've got to keep our fishermen 
uh, receiving paychecks. Otherwise, we're just going to tie up our vessels. Um, that happened again a second week in August and then a third, and then probably around late August, um, it became inevitable that we were going to run up to that 51,000 number. So, um, you know, any, anyone that thinks that we took this process lightly or thumbed our nose at the commission, that's just not my view of it. I mean, it was a very difficult decision of how do you balance going over the, the cap or going over the 51,000 number that you guys have set, and we have enormous respect for this, uh, this body we have for a long time, but how do you uh, kind of battle between telling your fishermen that you're going to tie up boats, not for any biological reason, there's tons of menhaden out there, but we just don't have access to them. So uh, I think the first week of September or so, we went over the 51,000 number, notified uh, a number of you all in a statement. Um, I take full responsibility if you guys read that letter to be aggressive or uh, flippant about the, the, the cap. That was not the, the intention. Um, we continued to have internal discussions and um, that letter made it look like we would go all the way up to the 87,000 number, which was in Virginia code. Uh, that was never our intent. So we came back and we said, you know, what, where are we going to voluntarily halt it this year? And that's how that 67,000 number came about. Um, 67,000 number combined with last year's harvest would still put the two-year average under the 51,000. You know, and the further you go back, the three-year average, the four-year average, that number drops. So in terms of this um, perennial exceeding of the cap, we've only gone over the 51,000 number one time probably in the last four or five years. Um, this is not troubling the stock at all. We get that it's a higher than the number that you asked us to stay within, but in terms of uh, deleterious effects of the stock, that's not the case. So uh, I can tell you now that our, our fishing in the bay has been halted sh short of the 67,000 number. Um, you know, we, we do that as an, as an offer of good faith that as we move forward, uh, which the real eye on the prize should be the ecological reference points and not the bay cap due to uh, a number of reasons, but we think that um, you know, the ecological reference points will be something that this commission can hang its hat on for a long time. Let's, let's look forward to that. Um, but you know, we understand that you guys are well within your prerogative to do whatever you guys want to do. So um, we give that. Uh, update to you all just to give you guys some color that this was not uh, this company that's been around for 106 years thumbing its nose at you. It was simply a difficult decision that we made to uh, keep our fishermen fishing and um, you know, we, if we would have thought that the population was troubled by this uh, I think the decision might have been different but since we've seen such a healthy ro robust stock um, that's kind of our thought process behind it. So I thank you for the opportunity to address you all. And I don't know if it's appropriate, but if you guys have questions, I'm happy to answer those as well. Uh, yeah, while you're in the seat, I guess we'll, if you're, if you're willing, uh, take a couple questions from board members if they have burning desire. Adam? Thank you. Can you describe what role in your decision-making process the fact that the Virginia legislature did not enact the updated cap in combination with this body's failure to pursue a not or decision not to pursue a non-compliance finding previously? Can you tell us what role that played in your decision-making? Um, no, thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Commissioner. Um, I, I would say uh, a little, to, to a little that um, we knew that you know the Virginia Code. We were not going to be found criminally liable, you know, uh, on the hook criminally because of the number in Virginia. It was 87. So I would say that that factored in. Was it a conscious effort to say we're going to go over this? You know, did we decide in April or May that we were going to go over this because the number was 87 and this board 
had given us some leeway, no. That was not into our, our, um, our calculus. Um, in fact, the decision was made because we, we haven't gone over this number. We've seen in, enormous schools out in the ocean of late, and the idea of catching over the 51,000 number in the bay was a bit shocking to us. Um, uh, I would say, you know, at least through the middle part of the season. So it had very little impact in us saying that we were going to go over this because we felt uh, comfortable from a regulatory standpoint. Does, does that answer your question? Thank you. Thank you. A couple other hands over here. Richie White. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Landry, for uh, taking our questions. Um, so it, it seemed what you were saying, if I understand you correctly, is that your decision to go over the cap was based on your analysis of the stock of Manhattan. And because uh, it's robust, then <clears throat> you decided that the, it did no harm uh, to go over that. Um, if Virginia uh, changes their management regime and adopts the 51,000 <clears> tons for Chesapeake Bay, um, <clears throat> will you make the decision based on um, your sense of the stock, or will you abide by that uh, quota if that becomes the law in Virginia? Um, if I'm correct, you're, you're saying that if a bill moves, makes its way through the General Assembly and gets adopted at 51,000 and that becomes the new number in the code, uh, we would adopt, we would adhere to that. We would, you know, we're not in the practice of breaking Virginia law. So uh, it, that would be the approach that we would take. And Senator Amira Mint. Thank you, Madam Chair. And mine was a, a statement and support for the motion that I'd like to come back to, not to question the public. Okay. Very good. Uh, were there any other questions for Mr. Landry? Tom Forty? You made a statement about having to tie up your boats at the dock and not send them out at that particular time. There's other dates, and you, you know that the Mahane are out in the ocean right now, so you could have basically gotten the quota you needed just by waiting until the ocean opened up and the, the storms quiet, quieted down. Well, that's true in a lot of the fisheries we manage. We make boats tied up. Don't you? And I'm thinking, are you ignorant of the fact that we do that in a whole bunch of other fisheries where ground fish fishermen have to stay at the dock, where fluke fishermen have to stay at the dock because we decide at certain periods of time and they don't ignore what the commission puts out there or the councils put out there. It's, it's in the understanding. Now, because you had a loophole in your Virginia law and it wasn't going to be a criminal act, it seemed to me it was a little ca cavalier to say, well, we can get away with this now. Especially in the fact that, and I think you must have realized this, is sooner or later, that's the question I'm asking. You would have got all the quota you needed to fill the gaps you needed by just waiting until the, when the sea settled down, as most of our boats, because we don't allow them to fish within three miles of the shore for draggers, for fluke, and things like that. So they have to wait till the ocean calms down. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm really having a hard time dealing with this the way you're putting it forward to me. Um, okay, so the only question I heard in there, if I was ignorant of the idea that other fisheries have to deal with the weather, and you know, clearly that we're aware of that. Um, our fear is that that's an awful lot of risk for the company uh, of our magnitude to take. And that's not uh, an indictment of other fisheries, but if we leave you know, uh, tens of, you know, dozens of thousands of metric tons on the table and we get weather in October, November, then we're going to be shy of that coastwide quota. So you guys have uh, apparently been comfortable with the coastwide quota numbers that you guys have given us and we haven't exceeded that, but we've always kept in our mind that we do have a smaller reserve in the bay and how do you manage that versus you know, trying to catch a coastwide quota versus trying to stay within the baywide quota. Um, so it was just a risk that we thought we could not take. 
As long as it's a question, Tom, I want comments about the behavior, you know, directed to the board's discussion and not asked of Mr. Landry. Okay, the question has to do with harvesting of smaller fish. It was always Omega's point of view um, when there were certain other states that were actually harvesting peanuts and they were harvesting one because they didn't have good oil contact. And wasn't those fish that you were harvesting not the most profitable fish because they weren't that big, the ones in the bay that you were harvesting at that time, compared to what you're getting in the ocean right now? Uh, I can't comment on the age classes of fish. Uh, National Marine Fishery Service has not yet provided the age classes to us. Um, but I would say it's a mixed bag. I mean, sometimes you get the bigger, oilier fish in the bay. Sometimes they're out in the ocean. Um, so that's never really been a, a huge part of our fishing operations is in terms of where to catch and how fat they may be. I mean, the hope is that they have plenty of oil content, sure, but you can catch, you know, sometimes those age three because of the highly migratory nature of them. You can catch those age threes, age fours in the bay from time to time, too. So. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Landry? Lynn Fagley? Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Ben, for um, offering your perspective. I, I just, I heard you say um, to keep your eye on the prize that are the ecological reference points, and I, I just, I don't know that this is a question or just I, can, I feel compelled to make everybody aware that um, we are on the cusp of being able to manage this with some ecological um, vision of this fishery. Um, and, you know, you had said, uh, you know, that, oh, this, the Menhaden stock is okay, but just please remember, everybody, that there is an eco a, a value judgment component to ecological reference points. We ran a survey to see what we wanted out of our striped bass fishery to help us how to, under, how to manage that. We talked about doing homework to think about what we want out of our fisheries as we develop these ecological reference points. So I would just ask you, Mr. Landry, um, to keep that in your mind because we don't want to hear, I don't personally want to hear that ecological reference point isn't set appropriately because it will be a value judgment. It's going to have that component, but it's going to be a scientifically backed one. So I just felt compelled to say that. Thank you, Madam. Looking to you, Ben, if you have anything to say. If not, I'll turn to, to Richie White. Uh, I, we, we very much hope that the ecological reference points carry a significant scientific uh, uh, nature to it. And it's not a, you know, that, that whatever happens at the Bay Cap hopefully can be rolled into ecological reference points and have some kind of scientific backing. That's our hope as well. Thank you. My mistake, it was actually uh, Rep. Abbott who had his hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Landry, for being here, and thank, thank you for taking my question. We know you're always here when there's a Menhaden meeting, for sure. In your description of the fishery this year, you talked about whatever reasons drove you back to Chesapeake Bay to catch fish because they were near the bay tunnels, wherever, wherever they were. Would I not be wrong in surmising that omega protein will go where the fish are when they need them, regardless of the numbers? That is the impression I, I think I'm left with. And would you not think it would be a dereliction of our duty as commissioners not to find the Commonwealth of Virginia out of compliance? Okay, yeah, yeah, I think that, is, to answer your first question, omega, uh, largely does go where the fish are. And, you know, that's within reason, of course. We're not going to travel too far up north, but we have a, a region, particularly in the mid-Atlantic, that, um, you know, our goal is to catch fish first outside of the bay, because that is the, the message that this commission and many stakeholders have, have provided with us. Um, so, yeah, I would say that we do go where the fish are when that's all, you know, at all possible. Um, I won't comment on your duty as a commissioner. Uh, you guys certainly are free to, to, to make the decision that you guys choose to. I would, um, listen, nor am I here to urge you on a particular place, but um, I would say that, you know, if you look at the 
you know, from 2000 to 2009, omega protein caught roughly around 92,000 metric tons in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, from 2010 through this year with the higher number, we're right at that 51,000 number that you've asked us to stay within. So I think if, while this year is that anomaly, this year is that, to use the term perhaps episodic event where they're all inside the bay, the goal of this commission to keep us at the 51 number has been met over a 10 year period. And um, so I, I would just offer that. Thank you. I'm going to turn to John McMurray for the last question to uh, Mr. Landry and then look to other public comments. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't actually have a question for Mr. Landry, but I have a question for Kate regarding uh, Mr. Landry's comments. Okay, go ahead, please. Uh, I may have misunderstood, but there seems to have been some inference that ERPs will give us some guidance on how to set a bay cap, um, but that's not the case, correct? Uh, my understanding is that the development of ERPs was a coastwide process. It's not going to provide us specific information on the Chesapeake Bay. So absent an entirely new stock assessment for the bay only, we need to set a limit based on other data, which is essentially what we did with the bay cap. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to thank you, Ben, for coming to the microphone for your testimony and a bit of a cross-examination there, um, and invite Tom Lilly to be next for the public comment. And at the same time, have the board be thinking about whether or not, I know Senator Miriman had a comment in support of the motion. If anyone else well, feels the need to make a, a comment on the motion, we'll come back to the board shortly. So, Mr. Lilly, uh, two minutes, please. Thank you. Uh, first thing I'd like you to keep in mind is that uh, you, I mentioned there's 2,500, 1,500 schools, rather, of Ben Aden that were coming down the Atlantic coast. We know that that's what, what's caught. The, the basic difficulty here is we don't know what is left in the water. We don't have a measure of that. You're allocating to Omega without a measurement of what is left or what the total is. Um, as a result of that, despite what Mr. Landry says, of those 1,500 schools, they could be catching 99% of them, and none of them are getting to the rockfish. Now, there's no question that we have a very good example in the spawning rockfish, biomass, down by, uh, what is it, 40%. Now, that is hurting the whole Atlantic coast. Those fish should be in the bay. We need Menhaden to feed those fish. And I think the answer, possibly, to what he had to say it's not so much what they did, but what have resulted in what you could have accomplished by if they hadn't done it. And what, if they had not done it, and I haven't heard this mentioned, as of September 1st, what would have happened? What would have happened as of t September 1st if they had not violated the sp spirit of that regulation? We would have had about 100 or 150 schools of Menhaden coming into the bay per day to feed our beleaguered Chesapeake Bay fish. That didn't happen because they violated the spirit of that regulation. That's the thing you were trying to accomplish. It got unaccomplished, if that's the word, by what they did. Right now, through all of September and October, Menhaden would have been coming into the bay to feed our beleaguered fish, and that didn't happen. So that's what this is all about. What didn't happen that would have, for the first time, benefited our Chesapeake Bay ecosystem so greatly, it could have made a huge difference, and it's not. So I think that's, I hope that's your answer. Thank you, Mr. Lilly. Were there others from the public? I didn't see any hands earlier. If not, we're going to bring the discussion back to the board. There was one more uh, hand raised from Senator Miriman to, um, in favor of the motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was just uh, reminded, well, a few days ago, reading the materials and coming across that letter, 
of what got me interested in preservation, becoming a member of the Marine Resources Committee in Maine, working with the commissioner in law enforcement, and realizing that how we got here with so many of the fisheries was the same attitude that I was reading, was that when a fishery doesn't like what somebody's telling them, they just say that it's not based in science or numerous things, and I expect that of them. So then it became the state that had to try to regulate, and they did a terrible job. And that's why this was formed and why I was so happy to be able to become a member because as states we get together and it's not subject to the votes and coming from your hometown and, and some bad rules being passed as we watch the fisheries dwindle. So I feel like we uh, are on track, but we need to support this amendment to make sure that the amount of work that goes into this now to protect fisheries, even if we err on the side of overprotecting them for a while, I, I, we have more than made up for it in the other direction, but I don't think that's the case here. I just want to make sure everybody knows that, that this is an essential board for doing just the kind of work that this amendment is stating. Thank you. Thank you. We've had a pretty robust discussion in favor of the motion. Does anyone want to speak against the motion? Bob Blue, is there something that you would like to add to the conversation? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I strongly support the motion. I'm deeply disappointed in Omega's actions. And I'd like to ask uh, regarding the exceedance of the cap, as I read section 4.3.7 of Amendment 3, it is, there's a clear payback provision in there. Will that be implemented necessarily irrespective of this motion? Is that a separate action that's going to be taking place for 2020? Thank you. Yes, the overage will be deducted from next year's cap of 51,000. I think we're ready for a vote on the motion. Is there a need to caucus? One minute caucus, so I can talk to my delegation. <laughs> the discussion can come back to the board. So I don't, I don't believe the motion needs to be reread. It hasn't changed since it was um, put up on the board. That we do have a request for a roll call vote, but I'll try the easy way first and ask if there is any opposition to the motion or absent abstentions. All right, two abstentions from the services, from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and uh, National Marine Fisheries Service, and uh, no further opposition. Uh, the motion carries. And um, I'll assume, um, Bob, that this will come before the policy board on Thursday? Yes, there's a placeholder agenda item on the policy board scheduled for Thursday morning, so. Thank you. Um, and uh, there's, uh, is there any other business to come before the board this afternoon? Seeing none, a motion to adjourn. So moved, uh, we are adjourned, thank you. We'll start the ACCSP uh, Coordinating Council at 3 o'clock. We've got some folks coming specifically for that meeting.